Well, Great, thank you so much, Jeff, um, for the introduction. I think you actually stole my thunder a little bit. Um, I'll go over a little bit of background about PFAS and where we can find them and how they got in the environment. Um, so as Jeff introduced a little bit, uh, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And you now know that PFAS aren't a single chemical, but a family of thousands of chemicals. And these materials were developed in the 1940s because of their unique heat resistant and nonstick properties. And they've been used in a variety of consumer products uh, for applications ranging from water resistance um, to nonstick cookware. Um, and also you can find them in firefighting foams. So they're very robust materials and difficult to degrade. And as a result, they persist in the environment after they're introduced there. Um, two PFAS that have received a lot of attention are PFOA and PFOS. Uh, you can see the structures on the right side of the screen here. Um, and I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the alphabet soup of this um, nomenclature. Uh, the PF in both of these abbreviations stands for perfluoro. And then the third letter in these abbreviations describes the number of carbons in the head of the molecule. So you can see that in PFOA and in PFOS, there is an eight carbon head. Um, so the abbreviation is OCTA. That's where the O comes from. And then the tail of PFOA is a carboxylic acid. And that gets an A notation. The tail of PFOS is a sulfonic acid. So that gets an S for sulfonic acid or sulfonate. Um, here's a small um, tree describing some of the breakdown of the PFAS family. So you can see that you can break down into categories of non-polymers and polymers. You can further break down into perfluoroalkyl substances and polyfluoro. So this describes the degree of unsaturation on the carbon backbone. Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail because, again, I don't want to list uh, the thousands of chemicals that are in this class. And the IPRC does a really good job of uh, breaking down the different classes of compounds and um, all the abbreviations that result in this alphabet soup. So I would uh, strongly encourage you to check out that resource if you're interested in learning more. So I wanted to take a little bit of time and reflect on where PFAS originated from and where have they gone since they've been made. And at this point in 2020, we've been seeing PFAS on the news and they show up on the EPA's radar. Um, but as Jeff mentioned, uh, the first PFAS compounds were synthesized in 1938. That was Teflon, um, which is a polymer that was synthesized by DuPont. Um, and I think this really frames the point that although we call PFAS emerging contaminants, they've really been around for a while and they're emerging to us now. <laughs> um, and so in the 1950s, we saw a scale up of the manufacture of PFAS um, chemicals at manufacturing plants across the country, namely in Minnesota. And then I wanted to also point out the first inquiry about the toxicity of PFOA came up in 1954. So not only have we known about these chemicals for a while, we've been wondering um, how toxic they are for a while as well. Uh, so the rest of the 60s through the 90s, I've highlighted some points of um, dumping and disposal of PFAS. Um, I wanted to also point out that aqueous Firefighting foams, or AFFF, were developed in the mid-1960s, so that's another abbreviation you might hear come up um, as we're still worried about disposal of AFFF foams today. Um, and so by the end of the 1990s, some litigation surrounding PFAS was beginning to emerge, and the EPA was first alerted um, with this PFAS issue. In the mid-2000s, documentation from DuPont's internal studies are brought to light as a result of litigation. Um, and litigation also brought around the C8 Health Project, which surveyed 70,000 people uh, for PFAS in their bodies and found a positive correlation of PFOA with certain cancers. Um, the 2010s onward show increasing litigation against responsible parties as PFAS testing has improved and PFAS continues to be identified in people in the environment. And recently, as Ava will talk a little bit more about, um, the EPA has proposed regulations for PFOS and PFOA in drinking water. Um, and Ava will elaborate a little on the regulatory process in a minute, but first she'll talk a little about where PFAS has been detected in the U.S. and the pathways through which it can enter the environment. So I'll hand it off to her. Thank 